In part two of this lesson, we're going to take our stars that we observe and start to group them in different ways and see what we can learn from grouping them. And we're going to group them using something called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or an HR diagram. And on an HR diagram, we plot the luminosity on one axis and the temperature on another axis. So these HR diagrams are very useful. And when we look at this HR diagram, um, we're going to plot luminosity on the vertical axis going from dim to bright. And we're going to plot temperature on the horizontal axis going from spectral class O to spectral class M. Now recall that spectral class O are hotter, bluer stars, and spectral class M are the cooler yellow and red stars. And that means that the horizontal axis goes from hot to cold, which may seem counterintuitive. But we'll see why that's the case. Um, if I take a lot of the stars and look at them, they will fall along a line. And this line is called the main sequence. So if I look at this Russell or this HR diagram, and I can see that the red stars fall on one end and the blue stars fall on another. And these stars fall on a straight line, which we call the main sequence. Main sequence stars are stars that are burning hydrogen in their core or fusing hydrogen in their core and producing helium. And there may be some other processes going on, which we'll study later. So there's another group of stars that then show up in the top right corner of an HR diagram. And these are the giants and the supergiants. These stars have very large radii. Um, they have very large luminosities, but they have lower temperatures than stars their size should have. So we will in the next few chapters come to understand what these giants and supergiants are. A couple of the supergiants and giants you may be familiar with. There is Polaris, the North Star, falls in this category. And Betelgeuse falls in this category, which is the upper left arm of Orion Nebula, or the Orion Galaxy. So there's another group of stars that we find on the bottom part of the HR diagram. And these stars have a very high temperature and a low luminosity. So these stars are called dwarf stars. So if you think about a star that's very hot but not very luminous, that means it must have a smaller radius. So these are smaller radii stars, and they're very hot. The larger giants, which fall into the red category, um, are very large stars and not very luminous because they're red. So for a star to not be very luminous and to be very large, um, it must be a cooler star. So if I put all this together, what we find then is that the luminosity of a star is related to both its temperature and its radius. And this is an HR diagram with a lot of the different stars on it. And here you can see a line of stars that range from 0.08, the solar mass, up to about 60 solar masses. Um, you see some supergiants and giants that don't fall along that main sequence. And you find some white dwarfs that have fallen down lower on the sequence. What we'll learn is that the larger a star is, the quicker it burns its fuel. So here we have come up with a way of classifying our stars. A star's full classification includes both the spectral type, which are the O, M, and so on, and they have luminosity classes, which are related to the shape and size of the star. So here we have additional classifications for line shapes. Um, I, or one, would be a supergiant, II or 2 would be a bright giant, 3 a giant, 4 a subgiant, and the main sequence stars are type 5. So a few examples. We have our own sun, which is a spectral type G2, and a type 5 main sequence star. We have Sirius, which is an A1 type 5, and we have a Betelgeuse, which is a supergiant or an M2 type 1 star. So that's how we can classify our stars. So how do you read a HR diagram? What is it that you look at here? Well, um, from an HR diagram, I am able to extract the temperature of a star, the luminosity of the star, um, the star's color, its mass, its radius, and its spectral type. That is a lot of information from a single plot. So you can see why these HR diagrams are important and very, very useful.
So main sequence stars, then, if I look at this line, these are stars that are fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. These are stars that are similar to the sun. And as I look along the main sequence line, I see our sun is here, and that's one solar mass. So any star that falls along this line would be a one solar mass star. And as I get smaller than the sun, um, I become redder and cooler. As I become larger than the sun, I become bluer and hotter. So I become more luminous and hotter. So here, hot the uh, blue stars you see in the sky are hot stars, and the red and yellow stars are cooler stars. Also, um, if I look at the main sequence here, I get these diagonal lines, which represent the mass of the stars. So my cooler, dimmer stars, my red and yellow stars are lower mass, and my large stars, my blue hot stars, are a higher mass star. So what we find then is the mass is what determines the temperature and the luminosity of the star. So why is a larger star hotter um, and more luminous than a smaller star? How does the luminosity and the mass temperature depend on the mass? Well, it's because of a hydrostatic equilibrium, um, a difference between the pressure and the radiation produced by a star. So if we look at a star in the core of the star, I'm producing radiation and energy, which is flowing outwards. And I have a lot of thermal energy, a lot of material moving around very fast. Of course, the star as a whole is very, very large. So I have a gravitational pressure, which is pushing inward. So the more material I have, the larger the star, the more gravitational pressure I have inward. And that causes a increase in the fusion rate, which creates more radiation outwards in order to balance that. So there's a wonderful balance between the gravitational pressure inward and the fusion rate, which is producing the outward radiation pressure and the thermal pressure pressing out. And these two balance each other in a wonderful thermostat. So the stars have a natural thermostat that balances is the inward crush of gravity to the outward um, energy flow from the core. So here, um, let's take a look at some of the ranges we find in stellar properties. Um, luminosity, um, we gather from the brightness of the star and its distance, and we can have one ten thousandth of the luminosity of the sun to a million sun's luminosity. Um, we get the temperature from the color and the spectral type, and it can range from around 3,000 Kelvin to 50,000 Kelvin. And recall the temperature here is the surface temperature, the temperature of the photosphere of the star. And we get the mass from the period and the separation in a binary system of stars. And that can range from 8% the mass of the sun to 100 times the mass of the sun. So how does mass and the life expectancy of a star relate? Um, our own sun has enough fuel to undergo nuclear fusion, converting hydrogen into helium, for a total of about 10 billion years. So let's look at some of the other stars. If I have a star that's 10 times the mass of our own sun, it has 10 times as much fuel. So you might think it's going to live longer than our sun. But because of the inward crush of gravity, it's burning that fuel much faster than our sun does. And it actually uses its fuel a thousand times faster than our sun. So a 10 solar mass star is going to exist for about 10 million years. What about a small star? If I have a star which is a 10% the size of our sun, it only has 10% as much fuel, but it doesn't have enough gravitational pressure to really drive the fusion reaction in the core as quickly, so it only uses it 100 times as fast as the fuel, the sun uses the fuel. So a star that's only 10% the size of our sun will be around or have enough fuel to live for about 100 billion years. So the smaller stars exist for much, much longer than the large stars. The large stars burn very, very brightly, but are not around for a very long time. What happens to these stars that are not on the main sequence? These are stars that are not confusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. They're existing by some other process. So stellar properties depend both on mass 
and age. So some of these have finished fusing their hydrogen into helium, and once they do that, they leave the group of stars on the main sequence. Um, all stars, though, become larger and redder after exhausting their core. So once the hydrogen is burnt up, and we'll study this process in a couple of lessons, um, they become giants and supergiants. Our sun will become a red giant for a brief period of time. Most stars, though, end up afterwards as small white cores of what was once left. And after fusion has ceased, these stars are white dwarfs. We'll also study that in a couple of lessons. Our sun will end up as being a white dwarf. So what are some other things that we find when we look in the sky besides just individual stars? Well, we find stars that are in clusters. We find stars that vary. So there are some stars that you look at, and it varies in brightness as you look at them. So they get dim, then they get bright, and they do this in a periodic fashion. And these are called variable stars. And the variable stars are stars that have trouble balancing their stellar thermostats. They have trouble balancing the radiation from the core and the inward crush of gravity. And it bounces back and forth between which one is dominant. And the brightest of these variable stars we call Cepheid variables. And this is an image of a Cepheid variable. And you can see how it goes through a dim period and then brightens. And these pictures are taken over the course of about a month. So you can see that as a variable star that we can see. So most of the variable stars will fall within the same region on an HR diagram. And we call that region the instability strip. And here you can see the Cepheids are the brightest or the most luminous of the, in, of the variable stars. But we also have the Lyrae variables and the Virginius variables, which are not quite as luminous and a little bit hotter. Um, also, stars tend to form in clusters, so I might have a region of space that is very prime for making new stars. So stars are born in groups, and we call these groups clusters, and there's a couple types of clusters. Um, specifically, there are two different types of clusters. There's the open cluster. Um, this is the Pleiades and sometimes it's called the Seven Sisters. If you're a stargazer um, and familiar with Orion and Orion's belt, if you look at Orion's arrow, it seems as if the tip of the arrow is the Pleiades. And if you ever have a telescope, this is a beautiful region of the sky to take a look at. The other way that we find these clusters are globular clusters. And here I have many, many stars grouped together um, in a cluster. Now, the stars in a cluster all tend to be about the same age. So we can learn a lot about the age of the stars in the cluster by looking at how they fall on an HR diagram. And if we look at a specific cluster, we'll call it the M55 cluster on an HR diagram, I get a lot of stars on the cluster that tend to fall along the main sequence. These are stars that are still burning hydrogen in their cores and converting it into helium. Here some stars have left the main sequence, and so these stars are stars that are no longer burning hydrogen in their core. If I plot that on top of another plot, and I see they're missing stars in this part of the main sequence. I have this main sequence. I have stars entering the red giant region. And I put that on top of the main sequence line. What I see then is that the stars that are around 10 billion years old have left the main sequence and are now forming red giants. The stars that have not yet reached an age of 10 billion years are still on the main sequence. So this tells me that the stars in this cluster were formed about 10 billion years ago. So it's a good way to tell the age of the stars in that region. And you can see this is about the same age that our sun will live till. So by looking at the groupings of stars and the similarities between stars, we were able to identify a main sequence, um, stars that are burning hydrogen. We were able to see a sequence of giants and supergiants and a sequence of white dwarfs. We'll study what happens to the stars once they leave the main sequence and how stars are formed in the next couple of lessons. So we were able to look at the stars and their infinite variety and extract information from the light that we receive from those stars. And from that light, we are able to discern the star's surface temperature 
its mass, its radius, its luminosity. And when we took all these stars and plotted them on an HR diagram, we found that the stars fell into groups and that those groups fell into a main sequence, which are stars that are burning hydrogen and forming helium in their cores, stars that have left the main sequence that are no longer using hydrogen to produce their energy, and those formed our giants and our supergiants. We found stars that had reached near the end of their life, and those were the white dwarfs, which are the remnants of ancient stars. We also found that some stars are not able to balance their thermostat, and there's a constant fight between the gravitational crush and the outward radiation, and these form the variables, the brightest of which are the Cepheid variables. So I hope you enjoyed the lesson, and feel free to contact me with any questions or concerns you might have.